And the reason why that's such a powerful question, because for whatever you do, if you have a strong enough why, you're almost unstoppable. If you set your mind to do something and you have a good why behind it, when the hard times come, you think about that why, and it gives you a little more resilience, a little more perseverance. So with that being the case, I ask ourselves, what is our why in being in Christ Jesus? You know, there are many blessings and benefits we can look at. Somebody may have helped you financially that was in the church. And that may have made you think, this is great. I want to be a part of that. That's a tremendous influence, but that shouldn't be your deepest reason why you remain in the Church of Christ. Somebody may have just been kind to you from the Church of Christ, and that was a part of your influence. That's a beautiful thing, but your why should be much deeper than that. As a matter of fact, when we read Romans 8 and 28, it lets us know that God has prepared for those who love him as long as we do things according to his purpose. So the best, probably the in, in business, they call it best practice. The best practice is probably our why should be exactly what God's why was. And we can see God's why. We just, uh, Thomas just read it for us so well in Hebrews 12 and verse two. I'll reiterate it quickly for emphasis sake. Hebrews 12, the verses two, Bible says, looking unto Jesus, we spoke about that briefly this morning. Now notice that that looking implies a continuation. It's not a, a one-shot deal. There should be a continued focus on that. And we see people that, that looked and then looked off on what happened. Probably the best example is Peter when he was walking on water. He was fine as long as he kept his eyes on, on Christ. When he began to look off and look at what was going on around him, he began to sink. And that's an incredible metaphor of just dealing with issues in life. But I, we should have a continual focus on Christ and whatever we do. When you leave that door opening, Satan can come in and just mess you up. Have you do things that you'll sit back and think, man, I need to go and get myself right for that. But may we keep our focus on Christ. Looking unto Jesus, it says, the author and finisher of our faith. We understand the authorship. He starts it. And he starts that when we're baptized. But, you know, we go to heaven. We don't need the faith anymore. So our faith does come to an end for a good reason, because we're with him. And that's a beautiful thing. But it says who, the who is referring to Jesus, for the joy that was set before him. And I can't read this scripture enough, because when you, as we walk through crucifixion this morning, it was nothing but torture. There was no immediate joy before Jesus. The joy was with him accomplishing that mission, he brought us salvation. That was joy to him. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Talk about, you know, they say the crucifixion is the greatest love story ever told. It's also the, the biggest sacrifice of all time. It was all about us through what he did. And I ask us as we listen this evening, as well as from this morning, ask yourself, when do you give up or get upset at something at the church and want to walk away? Is there anything that can make you that mad? It should, as we said this morning, Christ died for us. May we do all we can with this scripture to live for him. The Bible says, who for the joy that was said before him endured the cross. So he used thinking about his mission for us to make it through. That's a popular example for us on this side of life. When we go through things. Our why should be because Christ died for me. So I can make it through this side of life as well. Because he did it for me. That should take us a long way. It says despising the shame. And don't, don't, don't read loosely over that word shame. The Roman crucifixion was supposed to bring shame into the family. Because you were stripped naked and run through the streets. That was part of the process. That's why Paul said I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You see that crucifixion was quite different. Yes, it brought death to Christ, but he was also resurrected, but it brought eternal life to us. The Bible says, and after that, and, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. That's God's why, and that should be our why. Now, we're going to take another look and finish up Isaiah 53 to see what that process was and what can we get out of this 
to help strengthen our why so we can pull it up each and every day that we need it. We left off at Isaiah 53 and 3. I hope you have your Bibles. I don't usually put a lot of things on the PowerPoint, but sometimes you just got to turn the pages. We don't want you to get, just always need the PowerPoint. That's an extra benefit to keep us in sync, but sometimes we have to turn those pages. Isaiah 53, 3. Here, the Isaiah through the Holy Spirit says, he is talking about Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, talking about Christ, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. When, you, when we go through the Gospels and you see where the disciples left him alone, after everything he did and taught them. Let's take a look at that. Go to, if you have your Bibles, go to Luke 22. We're going to start at verse 54. We're going to see how he was rejected of men, how he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. All this for our benefit. Luke 22, picking up at verse 54, it says, Then took they him, him being Jesus, and led him, and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Why was Peter hanging so far back? He, he walked with this man, with this son of God. Verse 55, and when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. Verse 56, but a certain maid beheld him and said, and sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. Somebody noticed Peter was with Jesus, and she said it. This man was with Jesus. What do you think Peter said? Absolutely. He's the son of God. <laughs> this is what Peter said due to fear. You see, fear can overtake faith if we allow it. 57, and he being Peter denied him, saying, woman, I know him not. Wow. That's a denial. Verse 58, and after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. Mm, a sad commentary. Verse 59, in about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Everybody's recognizing Peter, and they should because he walked with Christ. Watch this. Verse 60, and Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately... While he yet spake, the cock crew. Remember, the Lord said he was going to deny him three times. Imagine if this was you, put yourself in the story. Verse 61. And the Lord turned, this is Jesus, and looked upon Peter. He had denied him for the third time. The Lord turned and looked at Peter square in the eye. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow. Thou shalt deny me thrice. In the last one, verse 62, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. There's some good news behind that. Because we're going to see where it obviously affected Peter. You know, as Christians, we can learn from this. Sometimes we're going to fall short. But are we going to let it define us? Are we going to let it be our story? Think of the story ended with Peter right here. Peter did a lot of powerful things in the book of Acts. Think if he would have felt so down from this that he said, I'm, I'm not a Christian. And we, when we tie in the feelings, that's so easy to do. I've spoken to many people over the years that said, I feel I need to be rebaptized. And I'll say, why? Because I just feel like I'm not saved. Well, the feelings have nothing to do with it. What are you doing? And if you were baptized right, you just need to reconnect with God. If you were baptized incorrectly, then yes, the Bible gives reason for rebaptism. That's if you were baptized incorrectly. You were taught wrong, so you were baptized wrong. But if you were taught right and baptized right, you, you're just falling short. And you need to recommit your life to Christ. That's the lesson for us. But now watch how Christ handles him after the resurrection. And notice how many times Christ asked him a question. We're at John chapter 21, beginning at verse 11. While well, you guys are getting it, I'm going to get on water. John chapter 21, beginning at verse 11. 
This is after the resurrection now, and now Jesus sees Peter. Now, wouldn't it have been so easy for Jesus to say, I'm on, you know what, I'm cutting you off. You denied me three times. Watch how Jesus handles this. John chapter 21 and the verses 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes. He was done fishing. And 150 and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Verse 12. Jesus saith unto, him, unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh the bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was risen from the dead. Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he's talking to him specifically, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me more than these? He saith unto him, this is Peter, yea, Lord, thou, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. That's one time. Verse 15. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. And verse 17, our last verse. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, loveth thou me? And he said unto the Lord, thou knowest all things. Knowest that I love thee, Jesus, saith unto him. And once again, Jesus said, feed my sheep. What I love about this is Christ came back. He denied him three times. Christ gave him a, a, a chance to say that he loved him three times. But notice what the focus was. Feed my sheep. Feed my lamb. It went all the way back to his why. Because he died for us, folks. Even in, and that's, that's when you watch Jesus, when he interacts, that channels everything. It was all about our salvation. That's why when you, when you go through it, I watch a lot of the, the history channel. And sometimes when they do, quote, unquote, Bible research, they'll say, well, really, the Romans killed uh, Jesus the Christ. And then one, one supposed uh, professor said, no, it was really the Jews who killed him because they sent him. And both of them are incorrect. You know who sent Christ to the, who, who sent Christ to the cross? All of us. Because there's not one person in the world that doesn't have sin. And that's why Christ went to the cross. So as opposed to these so-called so -called scholars pointing the finger at each other, why don't they accept the free gift that's right there in front of them? but they make it so difficult due to their vain babblings, as the Bible says. Back to Isaiah 53, verses four and five. Isaiah tells us about Jesus. Surely, and I love how that starts off, that's, that's a firmness. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. It would be so easy for Christ to say this is not fair. All the sin that we were going to do was put on him. I don't know about you, but that motivates me so much to just want to do better each and every day. What can we get out of that? We see in Romans 8, beginning at verse 31, when we realize what Christ did, this should make us, and I, I love an expression that my brother Gail uses. He says, if you want to know if we win, just read the end of the book when you get to Revelation. That's a book you, that's a book you can read and see that we have the, and if we realize that, we, that we've won yet future, how should we live right now? If somebody guaranteed you, you're going to run this one mile race, Brother Didell, no matter what, you're going to win. Wouldn't you run that race with a little bit, with a little bit more positivity and victory? Well, that's the kind of race we had. Let me let the scriptures tell you that. Romans 8, beginning at verse 31. Romans 8, beginning at verse 31. It says, 
What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he then that condemneth? Nobody can condemn you. Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That nakedness ties back to the Roman crucifixion. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You see, that's an honor. But look at verse 37, the last verse of this. Nay, or no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ. In him that loved us. Did it say we were conquerors? It said we are more, thank you, Sister Valerie, more than conquerors. How could you be more than a conqueror? By having that mindset even before the whole thing is finished yet. Jesus hasn't returned yet, but he's told us we're going to be victorious. So why aren't we living victorious now? That's why I'm so glad we're doing the book of Nehemiah in the morning when you read that model prayer. Nehemiah knew who he was going before, so he prepared for it. He didn't break down crying. He did all that before he stepped before God. And gave full adoration. And then gave full confession before both him and his people. Then gave thanksgiving. Then he got into the desire, his personal supplication. You see, that's firmness in who you're standing before. And if we're reflecting Christ, we're reflecting God and the Holy Spirit. How do we do that when tribulation hits our road? If we fall flat, we're reflecting the God that we worship. And that's not who he is. And y'all know my favorite scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He's not going to put on you more than you can handle. So if, you go, if you're in it, you can handle it. You may not think so from the flesh, but you can handle it. Because God knows. And that same scripture says he, he's provided a way out. You got to read that scripture. That's already, that's already preset, so you, he's letting you know you can handle this. And I provided a way out. You just have to hang in there until that day or time comes. That's called faithfulness. Didn't the Bible say that just shall live by faith? Didn't say should, it said shall, which means there is no, well, I, I'll try my best today. We have to do it. And we have the best example in Christ who did it completely. Let's continue back to Isaiah 53. We're at verse 6. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 is a pretty familiar verse to us. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's a powerful, sobering verse. We're going to jump to the New Testament and see where the sins were actually put on Christ. You know what that means between God the Father and God the Son? You see, sin, sin can't exist in the midst of God. So this is where Jesus had to bear that as the Son of God completely by himself. Let's go to Matthew 27, beginning at verse 45. Matthew 27 beginning at verse 45. It says, now, starting at verse 45, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the, all the land until the ninth hour. Jesus was on the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Now those who may be listening or new here, I'm not speaking in a supernatural tone. That's Aramaic. I've studied that so I can, I can pronounce it. I'm not doing that supernatural. I'm doing it because I studied it. So I want to make sure, or if anybody's listening on Zoom, 
because there is no need for supernatural knowledge. Now, God has given us his word published in 66 books. There's no new revelation. If I want to go to Spain and speak it, then I can get a Spanish Bible. But notice here what Jesus says. And, and this verse gives us the interpretation. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why has, why has thou forsaken me? And this verse gets a lot of attention. It's like, well, you have to understand the overall context. He's come down in the form of man. And we lean a lot on Christ being the son of God, which is very, very true. But when he came on the mission of a servant, when you get the context of Isaiah, he's in the context of a servant, which means he felt every bit of this, the pain. We, show, we showed you this morning when they offered him, they called it wine mingled, mingled with myrrh. That was an extension of the, of, the, the, of the Roman government. When you were in so much pain, they would give it to you and it would help numb some of the pain while you were dying. He denied it. Makes you want to say hallelujah. He wasn't, he was going, he felt every bit of it for us. Even when something was stretched out to him at a point of where I'm sure that pain had to have been something, something unbelievable but he still denied the wine mingled with myrrh. And now the fullness of the sins are on him. And his father had to turn his back and let his son deal with that. Many of us that have children, there are things that they go through when they go up that you, you kind of want to jump in and help them, but you're like, no, he needs to, needs to go ahead and learn. My youngest son is in the back. I remember when he was learning how to ride a bike. And you know, you, 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 want, you want to hold him without training wheels so long. But then when they finally get it, you feel so good. They got the lesson. Christ completed it and God the Father was happy about it because that was the goal and it had to be done according to the will of his Father. But he did that on behalf of us folks. I know that may sound like a primary lesson, but do we got to ask yourself, do you live like it's your why? Because if she doesn't, then we have to make adjustments. Bible says in Isaiah 53, as we hasten on here, Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Look at the verbiage. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? But he was caught off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people who were stricken. I want to switch over to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 6. You know, we see why the, the people that was closest to him didn't stick by him. But when we, when we just, when we go back and look at Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8, and we realize what he did for us, you know, God understands that we're human flesh too. So we are going to sin. But what kind of effect, what, what, what do we think of, what do we do when that happens? Is that handled in a real casual way or is it handled in a, in a real strict way? I love this. You got to, you got to always got to hold onto your seat when you read this verse, Hebrews six and six, it says, if they shall fall away and you can't fall away from something you've never been. So we're talking about Christians, but if they were to fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves, the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That's why, that's why we're not to play with sin. And if we do sin, we're to get it correct as soon as humanly possible. Because when we, when we don't take it as serious as we should, it says it's like we're crucifying Christ afresh. And if you heard the lesson this morning, how dare we even consider that? And the last two verses for this evening is the, the, the next to the last part of Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 9. It says, and he made his grave with the wicked 
and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, how did Christ make his grave with the rich and the, with the, rich and the wicked? Well, he was crucified between two thieves. They had done something wrong. And how was he buried with the rich? There was a gentleman at that time by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. He was known as a very rich man throughout the land. And he, he became a disciple of Christ. He begged the body of Christ and eventually got it. And he put Christ in his tomb. And it was the, the tomb of a rich man. That's how that scripture was. And it's amazing when you read that and then go forward and see how it happened. You see scripture fulfilled. Bible says in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord. See, although the Lord had to turn his back, there was a purpose there. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering, because that's what it was, an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. That fulfillment is in us. Ask yourself, after we leave, it's easy now that we're in worship, but after you leave the building, what are you going to show this world about, about Christ? Do your normal, we, and I love to say the best sermon or best lesson is not one that's spoken, it's just the action people see in your life. Is it not worth it? At the very least, is it not worth it? He chose to give us life in the most like I said, I, I do a lot of history research and crucifixion is known as in the top three worst ways to die. Because it was designed to make you feel like you're going to die, but it was designed to make you hold on to so they could torture you. And can you imagine Christ did no wrong, but they hated him that much? Can you imagine the way they must have put it on him? Oh, may it encourage us to live incredible, to be incredible lights in the kingdom for Christ Jesus, because he did it for us. And what's beautiful, he's let the world know through the gospel of Christ what it takes to be one in him. If you get caught up in shows that are on TBN, they, they don't lean to the truth, unfortunately. They call it the Trinity Broadcasting Network, but it's, it has a little bit of truth, but they have yet ever to see what a truth, the complete truth on how to be saved is taught. It's a lot of sensationalism. The Bible makes it clear, and that's what we need to take it back to. The Bible says you have to hear and believe the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ, made, the Bible makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. You have to hear and believe he did that for you. Bible continues to say that you have to repent. Simply put, turn from your multiple ways of making it in this life to doing it God's way. And a common mistake a lot of new people make is, well, I see what it means. But I need a little bit of time to take care of something. What are you, what are you going to take care of to get yourself ready to be, to be put in Christ? You're already in a sinful state. You can't do anything about that. The help you need is through the gospel of Christ. So don't let Satan influence you with those lies saying you have to go take care of this before. A lot of people are afraid. I can't live a perfect life. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. You need your brothers and sisters to help you. Is dealing with the world hard? Yes. But I tell you, is it worth it? Yes. When you compare heaven with the other place, I think if God would bless us with a if we could just go there real quick and come right back. <laughs> I don't think that there, there, there would be no doubt. Oh, no, I don't want to go there. Hell, the hell fire was designed for Satan and his angels, not for any human being. And God puts nobody there. We put ourselves there by our own decisions. But God has given us the playbook, the ultimate cheat sheet in these 66 books. If we, cho if we choose not to obey him, you can't put that on God. He's made it abundantly clear, but you have to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins. And the Bible says in Acts 8, those last four verses, you have to confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. 
because that's who he is. He is that. And there's only one son of God. There were a lot of incredible prophets. There were a lot of incredible teachers, which Jesus was as well. But there was only one son of God. And then the culminating act is you're baptized. You're completely put underwater. You're not baptized as a baby because then you still have to be rebaptized because you didn't know what you were doing. Babies say, God got goo goo and cry. They don't, they, they can't understand that. You know what? You know, you need to be baptized. They, they can't even respond to it. So it's really insane that that's a, even a false doctrine. It makes no sense. Babies have no sin. There's no pouring water or no sprinkling because it's not in the Bible. I've talked to a gentleman who still says it. I said, show me in the Bible. He says, you know, we've been doing that for years. I said, show me in the Bible. And this, this dates all the way back. He said, sometimes even before uh, BC. I said, what I'm asking you is, show me in the Bible. And he can't. He's staking his soul on just some tradition that people were doing. Just because somebody has been doing something for 90 years doesn't mean that you're right. It means they've been doing it for a long time. But sometimes when, when it comes to your soul, you got to investigate. I love to say when you, when you talk about people's money, they go investigate. If I were to tell you, if you invest one penny, I'll make sure you get a million dollars tomorrow. I bet you'd call me at 12.01 tonight. What's that million dollars you promised me? I gave you a penny yesterday. What about our soul? The money is going to get burned up eventually anyway. We can't take it with us. But the soul is going to go on forever. What's wonderful about that baptism? The Bible gives us at least three powerful blessings. Acts 2 and 38 says that's how we get the Holy Ghost. We don't go upstairs and tarry and all this other stuff that people try to do. They extrapolate something out of scripture that's out of context. We get the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. The one that God wants us to have through Acts 2 and 38 is the watery grave of baptism. You can read it. Crystal clear. According to Acts 22, verses 16 and 17, washes away all of our sins. And that would be good enough. But then as Christians, we're going to sin still. His blood still flows. Folks, what more could we ask for? The way he died for us and he continually provides a way for us to remain saved. That's a God you want to know. And then Acts 2 and 47, he places you into the church definite article. How beautiful is that? That's why you have to make sure you know the doctrine of where you worship. Because you're staking your soul on it. It's easy to go in and sit down and it sounds good. You say, amen, amen, amen. But are you really following up on what they're saying? Because that's a travesty when you look and say, wait a minute. I've been following that for 50 years, but the Bible doesn't say that. And it's easy to say, well, the quote-unquote reverend has been saying it for 50 years. I blame him. I've been faithful there. I'll introduce you to a scripture that says, if the blind lead the blind, the Bible says both fall into a ditch. In other words, that's not an excuse that's valid. And we know that if you're driving in a car and you're doing 90 and speed right through a stop sign and the cops stop you, you said, officer, what did I do wrong? He said, you went right through the cops. Um, you went right through the stop sign. Oh, I didn't see it. Do you think in most cases he's going to say, oh, okay, no problem. Just make sure you focus on the road, okay? No, usually you're going to say, no, you, you broke the law and you were doing 90. So we can't use that as an excuse. We have to study to see just like if you're driving, you need to know the rules of the road. If you are a Christian, that was what I said. The plan of salvation was for if you want to be baptized and become a Christian tonight. Because the water is ready. But if you're a Christian and your why has not been strong enough or your why has not pulled you into greater empowerment, I hope you can use some of these scriptures and go back. Because it's worth it. It's worth it. Just imagine the day the Bible says... When Christ returns, the dead in Christ are going to raise first. Those who uh, were baptized and were Christians, they're going to rise up first. And then we're going to go up with them. This Bible says in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Can you imagine seeing that happen? And you, you're jumping, hoping that you know, you, <laughs> you're going to be next. But it doesn't happen. The Bible clearly says that the just, talking about us, 
The just are scarcely saved. So no matter what we do, we just make it in. So we don't have, we don't have a whole lot of wiggle room, as we call it. The Bible says, and so shall we be with the Lord. You know how it ends? It says, comfort one another with these words. And that's what, that's my attempt tonight. It's worth, nothing should keep you from making it to heaven. Nothing, nothing should get you so upset that your, your mind is out of the game of making it to heaven. What could be sweeter than looking around like I'm looking around now? We make it to heaven, look around in heaven and see all the same faces. You know, I've seen uh, high school teams win championships. And it's funny how you jump around and your, your heart is just touched. We, we did it. We did it. We did it. Think about making it to heaven. Seeing these wonderful faces saying, folks, we made it. At that point, you ain't got to worry about nothing else. Right now, you may be thinking, I got I to go face the boss tomorrow. I got to finish this project when I get home after service. Hopefully, Brother Nelson will end here soon. And all kinds of, kind of stuff goes through your mind. But once we enter heaven, that's done. Is that not worth it? Now, one time did I say it was, it was easy. Now, one time did I not say it is hard. But the beautiful thing is, it is possible because it's not impossible. That's what I end with is all things are possible in Christ Jesus. If you need prayer as a Christian, I use this scripture every time and it's the only one that I need. And that is, prayers of the righteous avail much. If you want to obey the gospel, or if you're a Christian and you need prayer, we ask that you come forward now as Brother Lindsay sings our song of encouragement. There's a fountain free tears for you when we let a save so taste to its friend. Tis the fountain from the source of love, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come? To the mountain free, will you come? Tis for you, the thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a mountain open wall. There's a living stream. With a grace of from the throne of life, now it flows. While the waters let the weary soul in the fall that for freely goes. Who you call? To the mountain free. Will you come? Are you thirsty soul? Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's and the soul is blessed that may not is pure water shed. Tis for you and me, and the stream I see, let us hasten joyfully there. When you come, to the mountain free, will you come? Takes for you, let me first be sold. Hear the welcome call. Tis a mountain open for all. 